Welcome everybody to another episode of B Brown Bag. Uh, this is not B Brown Bag Latin, this is B Brown Bag US, but I did mess up and did not change the slide. Uh, tonight we are having Matt Crape at Matt, that IT guy, who is going to present building a Kubernetes lab in 40 minutes. So as always, we want to give you some quick notes. You can always get into the conversation with our global B Brown Bag uh, Twitter handles. We have B Brown Bag in the US and we also have B Brown Bag EMEA for Europe, B Brown Bag Latin in Spanish for Latin America and B Brown Bag Brazil. However, we all use B Brown Bag, uh, hashtag B Brown Bag to you know, help anyone with questions or have a conversation. Uh, like I said, we're global. We're everywhere around the world, uh, different days. Obviously, the U.S. show is the most popular. And I want to emphasize that we are still accepting talks for B Brown Bag U.S. Tech Talks during VM World 2020. So if you still have, uh, if you have a topic, if you were not accepted at VM World, if you didn't get it in for VMware Code, uh, you can also send it to us, and we will record it and play it in during VM World. So with that, uh, I am your host, Ariel Sanchez, at Ariel Sanchez More. You can tweet at me during questions during this show. I'll make sure to uh, ask them to Matt. And you can also use the, the Zoom interface if you want to ask questions or chat during the session. And I'll, I'll basically stop Matt from talking and ask him the question. So with You're that, good at doing that. To, yes. Uh, I, I don't know you that well, Matt, but uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of like a... I'm not very nice to people in general, so I am going to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt and I are good friends. I'm going to stop the share and send it over to you, Matt, for you to start presenting. Perfect. Thank you. So thanks for that introduction there, Ariel. Um, as mentioned, my name is Matt Crape. Uh, I occasionally blog at 42u.ca. I can be found on Twitter at Matt, that IT guy. Uh, by day, Ariel and I are actually kind of teammates. We're both uh, TAMs for VMware. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. So this session, uh, building a Kubernetes lab in 40 minutes, I always kind of like to dive a bit into the, you know, why, why did I choose to talk about this topic, regardless of what the presentation is. And the reason why I chose this one is, and, you know, especially in the V community, a lot of us come from, you know, a heavily influenced VMware background where we've done things traditionally with vSphere and we're very familiar with it. But there's been this talk about Kubernetes coming around for quite a while now. If you search far back enough, I think it was VMworld 2017, I did a V Brown Bag tech talk on containers at the time. And I even mentioned Kubernetes kind of in passing for lack of a better term. But since then, things have definitely exploded. So my goal with this session is to give folks who may not otherwise know how to kind of get started with a simple lab, give them the opportunity to see that it really isn't that difficult to get going, right? Quite often, getting your hands, you know, or your feet wet, you know, getting your hands dirty is the first step to really furthering your education a bit more. And this would be uh, a great way to dip your toe in the Kubernetes field. Now, the reason why I call it build a Kubernetes lab in 40 minutes, you'll see um, it's not actually going to take that long to build up the lab, but that's by design. I want to kind of bring it down to fairly low requirements. So something that you could do on a laptop, something to do on some Raspberry Pis if you have them kicking around. It, it essentially just make that barrier for entry low enough that you could start tinkering around with it. So that's a long winded version of the why. Now, before we get started, uh, I want to do a quick kind of what are containers 101. A lot of us are probably already quite familiar with what they are. Uh, but if you're not, or if you know, you're a little fuzzy on the details, in essence, think of a container as, um, you know, a, a package that has all the application dependencies that are required in one neat little all container, right? Hence the name. So you pull these things down. I, I like to use the example that, you know, let's say we're talking about notepad.exe. You know, a lot of us are very familiar with Windows operating system. 
at the end of the day, if you want to run notepad.exe, you have to install like, I don't know what Windows 10 installs up to now, probably 30, 40 gigs, something like that. So essentially you've got all this extra bloat in there to run this one executable. You know, not saying you can get rid of everything else. You obviously need some of the code that's in there to you know, actually run these executables. But you, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. You don't need Windows Media Player. You don't need an IIS, all that sort of junk. So if you take this idea of containers, what it does is it basically strips down or strips out all the other stuff you need. And instead it focuses on what, what is it that you do need and it packages those up. And what that really allows you to do is run these containers, you know, more or less isolated in the sense of, I download a container from a registry for notepad.exe, that's what it does. You know, I'm running version 0 0.001 and all of a sudden it goes, you know, to 0.1. I could just download the new container and away I go. So it, it's a great delivery mechanism for applications as well as multi-tier applications. Uh, once again, using the example of Windows, if I want to have you know, a web app that's running on IIS with a SQL Server backend, there's a whole lot of infrastructure that needs to be built out with that. Whereas on the container side, you could get you know, a simple container that would be running, whether it's WordPress, Nginx, what, whatever you want, you know, just download that, get that up and running. And similarly, you could pull down another one that's running some sort of SQL engine or a database for you as well. So there's a lot of benefits to these. So I've mentioned registries. These are basically resources that you could go to to find these containers. It's where they're published. So Docker Hub is likely one of the biggest ones out there. Um, and that's largely due to the fact that Docker, you know, is probably one of the more successful um, container um, organizations out there. They developed their container products, I want to say it was 2015, somebody could always correct me after the fact on that. Um, and they've grown, but they, they really sort of came to market at the right time, they targeted developers, and that's how they gained a lot of the market share. So they have these registries where you could basically go look up whatever containers somebody might post it there. Now on the flip side, you can also have private registries, which makes a lot more sense for a lot of organizations. And that's where you really start to see things being picked up. Obviously, you know, banks, you know, any sort of financial institution, government, really anything commercial, they're not going to want to publish their internal written apps out to a public resource for other folks to use. So I'm talking about all these great things about containers, right? There's a lot of usability there, but there's also a lot of quirks that come around with it. So most notably, um, well, there's two really big ones I wanna highlight. First one is storage. So these things, you power them down, you shut off the container, whatever was in there is gone, right? So obviously you don't want to be storing, let's say, uh, well, important data, whether that's configuration files or you know um, customer data, anything like that within the container, because if it needs to be powered down, say for an upgrade or or just hardware failure or whatever, you're going to lose what's in there. So you have to orchestrate a way to store that information elsewhere, something that could survive that container going down. The, the other one is networking. So containers are very easy to get up and running, you know, especially with Docker. And that in of itself kind of echoes, you know, back in the day, a lot of us were seeing VM sprawl when we really started getting into virtualization. It became so easy to start spinning up VMs that we almost took the point of virtualization, which was to run so many more workloads, you know, on one piece of bare metal hardware we started doing it where it's like, well, you know what? I, I can run 10 VMs on here and all of a sudden each VM is just doing one relatively small thing. Maybe this one's just a SMTP relay for you know internal lab use. So we started seeing sprawl like that. When you talk about containers and sprawl, with each one of them having their own network stack, all of a sudden you're in this point where, okay, handling one or two or three port redirects, all that sort of stuff, that, that's not too bad. What happens when you get up to dozens, hundreds, thousands? It becomes a real nightmare real quick. So those were the big characteristics I wanted to highlight, and those go along with the challenges of using these. 
So that's where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes at the end of the day is what's called um, an orchestration engine, orchestration tool, because what it does is it orchestrates how your containers are working. It can handle things such as, um, you know, making sure that um, there's the storage available, handle things like networking, handle things such as, okay, how many of these do I want from an availability standpoint, scaling up, scaling down, all that sort of good stuff, as well as just general placement of these things. You don't want to be going in there saying, okay, you know what, I want to deploy a container on this specific hardware host. No, you just go through Kubernetes and you say, hey, you know what, I currently have five of these applications running. It's, you know, Black Friday, I need to scale up to 30. Just go in there, change a couple of the config files and push it out and away you go. So you're, you're up and running. So as a bit of background, uh, Kubernetes is, um, it actually means um, pilot or helmsman. And it's a bit of a nautical theme, which, you know, kind of let borrows itself from the whole Dr. Whale. You'll see their logo. It's like a big um, steering wheel for a ship. But the big thing is that it's open source. So it was developed by Google. They open sourced it. And th th there are multiple flavors of Kubernetes. But what you want to look for if, you know, you choose to go down this road is you want to make sure that um, it's, you know, the, the flavor that you're using is based on kind of the core Kubernetes. That way you're not stuck left out in the cold if there's an upgrade that's coming down in the future. So a lot of us have probably heard of uh, the Tanzu suite from VMware. It's been announced, I guess, about a year ago-ish now. And for example, uh, the Kubernetes that's used in there, that is based on the open source project as well. And partially for those reasons I mentioned, so that you know you don't need to really worry about future compatibility. So I mentioned that it does or orchestration, right? So it does things such as workflows, um, you know, just general lifecycle management. It handles all those pain points of let's say you have an application that's actually made up of seven, eight, nine, ten different containers or more. You're able to handle that sort of at macro level saying, hey, this is what a deployment is. It, can, it includes all these things, but it also gives you the versatility to say, I just need to go in there and change this one module, this one container that's been updated. So think of it as a lot of us are quite familiar with large, um, you know, uh, line of business applications. You know, maybe we've got like this overarching ERP system that we do accounting in, inventory tracking, maybe payroll, all that sort of stuff. Think of the power of with these applications, if each one of these is its own module that you could go in there and basically upgrade on a whim. Oh, well, there's new tax rates that come out. Instead of having to update the whole entire application, you're able to just update that one small module within the application. So at the end of the day, Kubernetes solved this big problem of when you're running containers, there's a billion things that you might have to do. And I don't want to say that there's no good way to do it as much as there's no good way to do it efficiently. And that's sort of the gap that Kubernetes came in to fill. So some key terms that you'll <clears throat> probably hear as you start looking further into Kubernetes. Uh, so first one being the control plane. It, as the name implies, this is the interface used to control all, all the containers, right? So the life cycle of it. it it's one going out there doing the, the, the deployments, the touching of these things. Nodes are just endpoints. Um, think of them as almost like um, hosts in vSphere world. Uh, pod is basically the smallest object, right? So it's a set of containers running on a cluster. What that means is if you've got, going back to my example of, <clears throat> let's say a web server and a, a database server, you would probably tie those in the pod if they needed that sort of strong relationship. And again, going back to the whole nautical theme, like a pod of whales. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read through all these. I mean, it's been up here for a few minutes here, but uh, a few things I, I want to do want to point out is um, if you're not familiar with YAML, it's basically a markup language, uh, actually stands for yet another markup language. 
And that is the syntax that Kubernetes used to uh, get a lot of these things deployed. Don't get frustrated when you first start off. YAML can be very, very, very picky um, to the point where, hey, you've got an extra blank space here. You know, you've got five spaces or six spaces instead of five or something like that. So as a word of advice, just make sure you're using a good text editor that handles YAML and you'll probably save yourself from pulling out your hair a lot. So I'm actually going to jump into the lab portion here. <clears throat> so some few notes about the lab. I'm going to be running K3S by Rancher. Rancher is an, another entity out there, another company. They've got a bunch of their own uh, Kubernetes stuff, but they released this flavor called K3S. And it is intended to basically run on a lot of IoT type devices, such as Raspberry Pis. So as I mentioned, I originally uh, kind of put this talk together for vMugs and my intent was to more or less go around, have some Raspberry Pis, small network switch, laptop, and actually build the cluster up. So I'm going to mimic that in my home lab here by just using three Ubuntu VMs that I have. Um, ju just fairly plain installs and I'll cover that a little bit more. <clears throat> Uh, but my point is, you could run this on, you know, your VMware Fusion workstation or, um, you know, on Raspberry Pis if you have them. You could run it in vSphere. There's tons of different things that you can run this on. I mean, there's a bunch of online offerings as well. But at the end of the day, as you know, I mentioned, the barrier of entry to start dabbling with this stuff, it's actually quite low. And there's also a ton of other uh, very easy to start. Um, distributions out there as well. But I like this one just like I said because if you're actually showing it to someone th there's something nice about actually seeing the hardware and you know touching it even though it's just relatively simple stuff. The, the other thing that I like to note is there are multiple container runtime engines available. Like I said Docker is by far likely the, the most popular. Uh, this instance runs a uh, container D or container depending on how you want to pronounce that. And I don't know for a fact, I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that um, it, it just uses less resources. So going back to the whole IoT stuff. So at a high level, this is what I'm going to be doing because when, once we get going in the lab, I know how it is to watch someone run code and stuff like that. It, it's very, very easy to kind of get lost. So I, I want to put this together and to sort of describe the steps that we'll be going through, which is um, first we're going to deploy it, you know, verify that's actually running. Then we're actually going to deploy a small hello world type of app where you'll be able to pull up in a, a web page. We'll add a second node to our cluster. We'll, we'll get a little more complicated and you know, show you a Nginx deployment. Um, that's not actually going to have much in there, but I want you to see what it's like to actually deploy an application. Uh, then we'll actually deploy a multi-tier guestbook application. So once again, we'll create the deployment. You got the primary service, got secondary service, and there's also a front end. Push that out. Then we'll scale that up. You scale it down if we want. And lastly, we're going to remove it. So the other thing I want to give a shout out to is the Kubernetes documentation is absolutely phenomenal. <clears throat> a lot of the stuff came right from the documentation. And I decided to go that route because I mean, frankly, there's no reason in reinventing the wheel. So th these are just a couple of small examples that you'll be able to find on there. Uh, but when, once you get an idea of logically what you're doing, I'd highly encourage you to go through the documentation there and actually start poking a little bit deeper and you know, going deeper than what we're going to do here. So with that, I am going to get things going here. So this is my home lab. You'll see I've got just three VMs here, primary, node one, node two, nothing fancy. Um, I actually uh, have just a template that I use. This, 1804 template down here. And I actually built it off. I want to give this uh, blog post a quick shout out here. 
nothing fancy, but you know, it's fairly straightforward some stuff to do. So if you want to do this on in your own home lab, basically just you know do a vanilla vanilla install, do the upgrades, install the open tools, strip out some unique data. You'll see here they mentioned that they did some of this um, additional configuration for uh, Cubeadmin. I didn't do that for mine. Uh, but if you're looking to um, build a similar VM template, I encourage you to check out this blog post uh, by Jim An Angelio or Angel. So back to this. <clears throat> oh, and for bonus points, I've been hanging around Joe Hughes too much and opted to script this, just a simple little script here. If anyone wants this, feel free to reach out to me. But essentially what it does is it'll go whoa, through. Whoa, 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 whoa. It has to be in your GitHub. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I'll post something there. Um, in I, short, I, what, I, sure. In short, what this does is it basically just connects the vCenter. If the folder doesn't exist based on the variables up here, it'll create the folder, goes in there, stops any running VMs, deletes them, and spins up three new ones, you know, primary node, one node, two, based off that template. So nothing uh, too crazy, but um, I found that was very useful when I was putting this together, just because I was able to go in there so quickly and essentially rebuild my lab. So uh, the first thing that we'll do here is I am going to pull up my putty. Oh. And I've pre-populated these just to save on some typing. So what you would need to do first of all is make sure that you change the host name. So I already did that prior, just kind of like watching one of those baking shows. Um, just so you would need to watch me go through and change host names on three different VMs and reboot them. So with that done, uh, I mentioned that we're going to be using K3S. So you can check out their web page here. And a little bit of a spoiler alert. To actually get started, this is actually all you need to run. Yes, you're running a script from the internet. Will I do this in production? No. Will I do in the home lab? Sure. So we're going to let that run there. But if you actually go here, if you're curious, you can go take a look at the script read through that. There, there's actually additional parameters that you could pass along as well if uh, you choose to do so. And that's one of those things where once again, you might decide once you get this up and running, dig a little bit deeper. Uh, but the short of it is you could go here and see what's actually being done, or you could just run that script. Now, what I do like about the script, uh, a couple of things I'll point out here is if you actually go through this, You'll see they create some sim links, so you can use like kubectl. That's kind of the, the main admin tool uh, when you're using um, Kubernetes, as the name implies. It's the control tool. tool. So they just create a sim link for you. Um, I also like they put a little uninstall script in there, right? <clears throat> so if you're playing around and this isn't a dedicated machine, and you decide, hey, you know, I'm done with it, it's easy enough to get uninstalled. So, with that installed, we can actually just run kubectl get node. Oh, let's try this again. There we go. So status is running, its role is master. I'll tell you the version, it's been running for 45 seconds. So if we run that again, 57 seconds, right? So you can see that's actually <clears throat> doing something. And I mentioned that this is fairly small footprint. So if we run HTOP, you'll see I only gave this VM about four gigs and it's only using about 665 megs, right? And this is for, you know, an Ubuntu install. So it's not even like it's Raspbian or something. So the footprint on this thing is actually quite small, which makes it very suitable for I'm sure you could probably run this on Raspberry Pi's version two, right? Uh, without much trouble. And that being said, if you do have uh, different generations of Raspberry Pi's kicking around, feel free to try put them all up to the same cluster. So if we want to actually take a look at the configuration for this, I'll pull up K3S's YAML file here. Oh, do I not have, oh, there we go. And you'll see a bunch of, 
Well, it might look like just gobbledygook in here. But certif uh, certificate info, you'll see it's listing on port 6443. Down here, we've got a username and a password. So if we actually copy that, and then if I go into the host, so what was the IP on this one? This one is 108. We go to 6443. We'll see we're getting a secured page and I say admin, paste in that password. And we actually have access now to a um, bunch of varying directories that are hosted on that uh, master node, in including, for example, you know, if we want to go into APIs, you can see different APIs available. So I'm showing this just to kind of show um, a bit of a communication path, for lack of a better word. Cool. So we've got that node deployed. So now what? Now I want to show this fellow's GitHub page here, Paul Bauer. He's got this little Hello Kubernetes application, for lack of a better word, or deployment, I should call it. So what it does is basically you pull it down and you should be able to access this on port 8080 when it's up and running. So how do we go about doing that? So if you go in here, um, you can see this is the actual <clears throat> code. You can go to raw. Now the, the great thing about Kubernetes is you could just pull some of these configs down from the internet. Once again, you know, security and all that stuff, take note. But if we just do something like this, so we say kubectl apply, the dash f means the file, and then where's the location? So we're pointing to the GitHub repo. And you'll see that it's basically up and running there, or rather it pulled it down. So if we go back over here, uh, was this the one? I've got the memory of a goldfish. What was that IP? 108, I think, yeah. And was it port 8080 that I was looking for? Might be missing the HTTPS too. Oh, probably. Nope. Let's see here. Shouldn't, shouldn't trust that aerial guy. <laughs> oh, I know why. Apologies, we need to find the port that's actually running on now. So here we go. So I mentioned that there's a whole bunch of internal networking and stuff. So it's internal IP is this fella here. And what it's doing is it's going to take port 3513 external. So on this host here and map it to port 80 internally here. So now if we paste that port there and probably get rid of that S. There we go. So we've got our first deployment in the book here. Um, I also mentioned some other stuff. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but for example, namespaces. If you want to do stuff like that, you know, once again, cube cuddle, create namespace. I don't know, we'll call it VBB. And also I've got this namespace created. So think of these as um, almost like folders in vSphere, right? They're, they're ways to kind of logically group things together. So get namespace. And you'll see we got a few of them here, right? Including the v, VBB, which I just created. So next, let's talk about adding a second node. So I am going to pull up another putty session here. Go to node one, have a different color. That might be a little hard to read. Let me know if it is. I can always change the, uh, the color. I would, it is kind of hard. Yeah, so all I'm doing here is just logging in. Uh, you know, give me a moment here. Let's close that down.
Mm, I can't hear you, man. <laughs> How did you get muted? Well, thanks for having me back. <laughs> okay, I assume you could hear me now? Yes. Okay, so let's just change that uh, foreground color. Yeah, I think I went on mute there and uh, won't let me back in. Okay. So we'll go back in here again. Once again, thing that we want to note is that we've changed the host name on this one, which is good there. And uh, what we'll do here is on the server node, you have these tokens and you need them in order to actually join new nodes to the cluster. So the token is stored in this path for K3S. Simple cat on there will show you the actual token. So I am going to copy that to a notepad and I'll show you why in a moment. On the second node or the new node, we basically run that curl command again uh, that we did to install it the first time around. However, there's additional parameters that can be um, used to um, automatically hook it up to the cluster. So I'll need to change the IP on this one to 108. But you'll see it's very, first part here is very similar. Then we've got the environment variables here where we're saying connect to the IP of the master that's currently running and use this token. So if we run this, on the on node 01. Let's see, it's downloading. And for the record, I, I've got DSL here, you know, 50 meg down. So, you know, it's not a blazing fast internet connection, but the install itself is actually quite small. So this won't take very long. And there you go, so you're done. So even if you're out in the middle of nowhere, like West Virginia or something like that, you should actually be able to get this downloaded and running. Why are you comparing West Virginia to like Siberia? <laughs> I, I know a guy, uh, Jim Jones over there, he has internet. <laughs> barely. <laughs> I think he's got the, uh, the bandwidth of uh, two tin cans and a piece of string. That, yeah, that's going to shots fired, I, I agree. <laughs> so next what we're going to do is we are going to create an nginx deployment so i mentioned that the kubernetes documentation is great and i'm going to leverage that again so if we'll look at this yaml file i'm just pulling up here this is what i'm going to feed into it in a moment here so, I mean, nothing overly straightforward. You'll see a lot of the same things over and over, app, app, app. But what we're looking at here is, you know, deployment. That, that's kind of setting it, uh, defining what type of action that we're doing here. So, go back into, we can run on node one here. Oh, or maybe not. Oh, apologies. Let's go. There we go. You got to run that from the uh, the master. And now if we say cube cuddle, get deployment. You'll see we've got our Nginx. Zero of three are running. Three are up to date. Zero available. So it's only been running for nine seconds. 19. We'll give it a little bit of time here and we should see those numbers start to go up. So part of the reason why it's taking so long in the background is I did not previously have that Nginx container downloaded. So it's going out to a registry right now and it's actually downloading Nginx in the background. Once again, these things aren't huge. And there you go. So if we want to check the deployment status, See, there we go, things are rolled out. And if we want to check the replica status, 
you can say get RS. You'll see we've got this thing of desired. We want to have three of these running. Currently there are three and all three are ready to use. So this goes back to um, how many of these replicas do you want? So for uh, availability standpoint, if this was 10, it would be ramping up 10 of these. So now that we've got some stuff running, let's take a look at the cluster. And that's just kubectl cluster dash info. <clears throat> and you know, it just confirms that everything's running, core DNS is running, you know, nothing too crazy here. So let's move on to that more complicated um, example that I was showing. So once again, full disclosure, you can find this easily within the um, Kubernetes documentation. And once again, I highly encourage you to go through and actually take a look at these. So this is an example of a stateless application. So when it's powered down, when it's gone, it's gone. But there's nothing that's actually remaining. So as mentioned previously, at a high level, we're going to go through the steps here of um, creating the deployment, uh, de deploying the actual services, deploying the back end, and so forth and so forth. And we'll scale things up after. So we're back on the primary node here. And we'll pull down another configuration. <clears throat> so once again, we're pulling down the file that's located here on the Kubernetes documentation site under their examples. And it's pulling it down. But I get impatient. So let's check the status on this thing. So this is where those pods would come in again. So we say kubectl get pods, show me my pods I have running. And you'll see we've got a few of them, right? We've got the hello Kubernetes one running. We've got uh, the Nginx deployment. And then we've got this one here that, that's uh, Redis master. So that's part of what we're deploying right now. So once again, it's not quite ready yet. Status, it's still creating the container. So we'll give that a moment here. I think it usually takes just under a minute on my uh, home lab here. So bear with it for a few more seconds. But it also requires um, that service as well. So once again, we could just pull down the master service file here. And we'll see, it's gonna be the same thing. If we run the get pods, <clears throat> we'll see that master is actually running now. So the reason why we don't see that other one running now, the, um, the service is because we have to say get service. And that comes down to that st distinction between these sort of object types in Kubernetes. You know, you've got pods, you've got services. There, there's a wide variety of object types that I won't go into too much right now. Um, but the, it, it's one of those things where, once again, documentation is king for the sort of stuff. Go through there and start looking at them. And um, there'll be some great stuff, you know, sort of highlighting the differences between these. So we got the um, services running here, Redis master. So that's good there. So now we need to do what's called the slave service. So once again, it's multi-tiered. Uh, you've got the primary and the secondary that are being used. And if we go check on the pods again, we'll see, okay, it's trying to run two of them still creating the containers. So <clears throat> still downloading the background, still provisioning, all that sort of, sort of stuff. But for the sake of time and whatnot, let's move forward as those are being created in the background. So this is a part now where we are creating the discovery service. Once again, you can go check out the actual YAML file. You can actually go there, download it to your machine, edit it, post it somewhere, you know, put it onto one of these devices and um, alter it how you see fit. So now if we say get services, we'll see things are running good here, running for seven seconds. Cool. And lastly, the last uh, sort of portion of this application is the web front end. So same thing, we'll pull down the uh, pre-constructed YAML file. 
And now, if we do something like this, um, I want to point out these things called labels. So think of them kind of as like vSphere tags. So the command I ran here is show me pods, but the dash L says for the label for the app equals guestbook and the label for the tier equals front end. So when you're running these things at scale, you've got many, many different types of deployments in play here, many different types of pods. That's where you could really start to leverage these labels. And maybe Matt, you can show in the YAML file when they are defining what they want to run, that's where they set the labels, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? So let's actually pull that up right here. So if we say labels, so there's nothing up here. So, but down here we got guest book front end. Oh, sorry, there we got the app. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yeah, Ariel, very much to your point, you could go in there and once again, when you're kind of mucking around in the lab, go in there and change these. Play around with them, see, see what works, see what doesn't work. So if I were to run the same command again without those labels, you'll see the list is gonna be a lot longer. And then lastly, we basically need to run this front end service here. So what we did step before is we created the, created the deployment for the front end. Now we're actually creating the service for it. And if we run the cube cuddle get services, uh, You'll see, we've got front end running. It's on port 3621. So now if we go back to our our primary node here, and I think it was 108, and what port did I say that was? 3621. See, we've got our guest book up and running. And then you'll see some stuff that I did previously in here. So let's say if you ground break rocks. And you, you can also declare, declare your war with West Virginia in the guest book. <laughs> By there the way, go. Joe joined the, the V Brown bag just to see what the code was that basically you said inspired, was inspired by him. Well, he missed it. <laughs> He's like, what's the, what's the recording? <laughs> So uh, we just did uh, get pods here, right? So I mentioned that we've got lots of these things running right now. So let's talk about scaling, right? We've got different things running here. Let's say all of a sudden this guest book becomes massively popular. I say, you know what? It needs to scale it up to five. So the command there you'll see is cube kernel scale deployment, you know, the deployment's front end dash dash repl replicas, how many do I want? Up here, you'll see front end, front end, front end. So I had three of them. Down here, you'll see I got five. And if you look at the status, you can see it's still spinning these ones up. So if we run that again, yeah, they're still being spun up. So I don't have a count on how long that took, but once again, probably somewhere around the, the minute mark. But similarly, let's say, oh, you know what? Traffic's dying down. I don't know if I'm running this in you know, Google Cloud, or I'm paying for it, whatever. Let's scale it back down. This is where those labels come in handy again. So you can say, you know what? I'm gonna delete things, right? You, you can delete based off of labels. So it's a very quick way to you know, um, spin up your applications if you need more replicas. Similarly, if you want to decommission these things in a hurry, these labels are fantastic. So just before I do that, we'll see. Yep, yeah, so these are all up and running. If I could go back in here, I could say, you know what? Replica is one. Let's scale it back down. And you'll see it's now terminating those. And there we go. Now we're just back down to one front end. So you could do this with, you know, pretty much any of these running here, but let's fully decommission this. So we're deleting 
anything with uh, deployment, any labels, sorry, we're deleting deployment to have the labels of Redis. Then we'll do the same thing for the service. Those are gone. Then we'll do the same thing for the guest book. And lastly, uh, well, guest book service. And then if we say, come on, where's my get pods? There we go. You'll see those things are spinning down. And then we're just left with the Nginx ones and the Hello Kubernetes. And if I go back here, service is down. So as I mentioned, I know that could be a little bit of a, a whirlwind with regards to um, you know, watching someone do all the stuff on code, but to reiterate what we did, we went through, we deployed it, um, the actual K3's engine, ran a little hello world one, added a second node, uh, deployed the engine X deployment, then we did the multi-gear te uh, tier guest book, and we did the scaling and we removed it. So there, there's definitely tons and tons and tons of resources to dig deeper available. Uh, one of the popular ones is Kubernetes the hard way. And I always love the name of that because while folks aren't familiar, familiar with it would say, why would I choose to do something the hard way? And the philosophy behind it is Kelsey Hightower wrote this to show you how to do a lot of these things manually so that you can appreciate when you're actually doing them the automated way. It gives you a far better understanding. Um, kind, that, that's another um, easy way to get up and running. It actually stands for Kubernetes in Docker. So they're basically get your Kubernetes environment up and running in containers. Um, so it's another whole layer of abstraction in there. There's some labs, um, Kube.academy, that's from VMware free to go check that out. I mentioned the Kubernetes.io docs, fantastic stuff. And lastly, this one down here, uh, Joe actually pointed that to me. Um, it's not Kubernetes per se, but a, a graphical way to manage containers. So if you want to kind of, you know, get more familiar with Docker and containers in general, uh, Portainer is a great web interface to allow you to kind of visually see how to manage the life cycle of these containers. So with that, I am done. I don't know if there's any questions or anything else that we want to wrap up here, but uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Ariel. Well, we actually have uh, Joe was putting in a comment. What I'll do is I'll, I'll open up his microphone if he can. Oh, well, maybe that's a mistake. You. Sorry? That That's a mistake. We're talking Joe Hughes. <laughs> Joe Hughes. He's allowed to talk now. Har har, Matt. Very funny. <laughs> How you doing, Joe? Doing good, guys. Good. Good session, man. Thank you. It's a great list of resources there. So I had uh, also dropped in the chat for anybody that's uh, learning some basics on this. There's actually two other web-based platforms that are really good. There's Katakoda and instruct uh, with a Q instead of a C. Those are great uh, web-based utilities that you can actually get through everything in the console, but it's all already hosted. Um, so you can really literally just copy and paste, follow their explanations and kind of see everything working and click back and forth from the consoles to like the web browsers for all the apps that are inside of there and everything. So people that are just trying to learn the mechanics without building everything from scratch um, can get started and learn the concepts pretty quickly. Yeah, one thing that amazed me when I was kind of putting this together is there's just absolutely no shortage in uh, learning material available for Kubernetes, right? And I mean, to some regard, that, that, that can also be overwhelming because you, you really just don't know where to start. But there's so many um, available out there that um, could get you literally up and running in the web browser if you want, right? So Matt, have you thought about how we're gonna give away some of the swag that we have available? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so I have a backup plan because I have to be prepared. Uh, click on the chat and that last uh, link that I put in there yep. was a, a blog post from William Lamb where he was, when he was learning Kubernetes, he shared some 
interesting Kubernetes application demos. So very much like the uh, applications that Matt has shown today, he, he basically made a blog post saying, hey, here's some other uh, apps that you can use when you're testing stuff in your home lab. And the one that catches my eye is the last one, which is a way to destroy your pods by playing Doom. <laughs> so one cool thing about Kubernetes is that you tell it what you want and it carries it out. And if for some reason the state changes, it will, you know, auto heal itself and create more pods. Let's say some pods died, uh, it will create the pods again. So in theory, what you're doing with this game is testing your applications re uh, uh, reliant resilience. And you can basically destroy some pods and see it spin up some more pods. But obviously, the what we're here for is basically that showing doom, right? Uh, I don't know if you can if you can show that on your screen. If you yeah, have internet yeah, access, right I, I don't know if you're in West Virginia or something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so each one of those things that in that cube of doom, each one of those devils outside the window. That's each one of them represents a pod. So when you when you shoot one, it destroys it. You can see it in the kubectl get pods over there. So if someone gets this running in their home lab uh, that's watching this and had never run a, a Kubernetes application before and basically uh, was able to do it because of uh, the resources that Matt put out here today, let him know um, and he'll give you you know send him my ad send send him your address. He'll send you a one hundred dollar gift card, and I'll send you the bug. <laughs> well, it'll be a hundred Canadian dollars, right? So, <laughs> comes out to like thirty seven cents or something. <laughs> Maybe you'll just get the mug. But we have a couple of mugs here to give away. We have some stickers. We have some other things. So, if anybody uh, wants to uh, take the challenge, uh, we'll reward you. All right, Matt, do you have anything else or anybody else have any questions for Matt? Silence is golden. All right. Well, thank you again, Matt. I re we really appreciate this. It's, a, it's great to see uh, the big community helping each other learn, especially when, you know, if you have nowhere to start, this is a great starting point. And thank you everyone that attended live and we're looking forward to your comments. And for everybody in West Virginia, his uh, Twitter is at Matt, that IT guy. <laughs> Have a great night and thank you so much. Thanks all.